Good morning, Life Church. Stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. If you're a guest here this morning, let me say welcome, and we would love to connect with you. A simple way to do that is to download the Life Church Emporia app from iTunes or Google Play and fill out the digital connection card on the tab that says New Here. If you haven't been receiving our emails from Life Church, please let us know by emailing lifechurch at lifechurchemporia.com. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, there are a number of ways that you can connect this week through small groups, life groups, and Bible studies. Check the digital bulletin on the LC app or the Life Church Emporia Facebook page or Instagram account to get more details on what's happening for you. Stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, thank you so much for your continued faithfulness in giving and your support of our missionaries at home and around the globe. If you'd like to join in giving or want to send your mission support, you can find details on giving at lifechurchemporia.com slash give. If you want to give through text, that number is 620-236-6789. And if you've downloaded the Life Church Emporia app, you can find information on giving by selecting the give tile. If you've got any questions about giving, please contact Sarah Jennick. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin.
it's good. It's actually a great morning, right? Let's all stand together today. Lord Jesus, again, thank you for this opportunity to come together with other believers, with family, and lift up your awesome and mighty name. You are so worthy of our praise, and today we want to worship you together. We want to make you known here in this place and as we live our lives. God, may we make you known everywhere that we go. Come and have your way in this place and do what only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. far 
Thank you that there is no battle that we are in that's too hard for you. There's nothing that we are walking through that is too far gone from you, Jesus. You are able and you are faithful and you are good. We declare that today. I know there may be some here that are going through the hardest thing that they've ever faced. But God sees you. Jesus sees you. And he has already made a way for you. Stick it out. Keep walking the good, fighting the good fight, running the good race. Stay with Jesus. Keep following him and trusting him. He promises to never leave us, to never forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. You are mighty. We love you today. We love you, Lord. Freedom 
guests here this morning. Can we just welcome all of our Life Church guests today as well? So looking around, thank you for being here. So glad you're with us today. As you can tell, we're beginning a brand new series today. And also before we get started, just to let you know, we're looking forward to our Easter celebration Sunday, August, or August, April 17th. That's a little late on, on Easter, right? Three weeks away. Um, that morning, um, there's going to be a little bit different schedule. Pay attention there, allowing for fellowship. Um, also a big day for the kids, so we're excited about that. As we begin this morning, um, it's important to me that you understand why we're looking at a series like this one, especially around Easter time. Um, most of us, as God's people are probably aware of what feels like, to most of us, a balancing act. In fact, so, so, so take many of us in the room, for instance, there's a lot of people in the room who are very passionate about God's truth. How many of you this morning, you're like, man, you love God's Word, amen? So there's a lot of us in here that are like that, you know, and so, um, but, but if we're not careful we could potentially confuse our stance of standing firm in God's truth, which, here's the deal, if we're going to love God's word and love God's truth, it's going to cause us to hate evil, amen? Especially with all the evil that's been taking place in the world as of late, I mean, if you've not noticed, if you've not noticed, you might want to wake up. So, so that, that, that as a result, I'm saying this, you know, we confuse our hate for the world with a hate for people instead of a love for people. And so what happens is that times we could be, we could become paralyzed because we may wrestle with what to do. In fact, what do I do with the tension between these two things? How do I stand firm and also at the same time, how do I still love people well. I mean, I mean, really, is, is anyone doing that right these days? I mean, I'm saying this because, I mean, I, 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 we see very few doing that. What happens is in Christianity, some will charge ahead and run over people with, man, truth, truth, truth. And again, listen, should we be people of truth? Absolutely, we should be people of truth. Others, what they'll do is they'll swing the pendulum in a completely opposite direction by being so grace-filled that they take on a liberal stance. And even some, they'll ignore the truth, uh, the truth altogether. But I don't want to do any of those things, do you? I mean, I, I want to stand firm on God's Word, and at the same time, I want to love people. That's the heart of God. And that is a tightrope in the Christian faith. Very much something that feels like a, a balancing act, if you will. I mean, there are people in this community, listen, that, that will not know what to do with themselves if along with your standing firm, you love them, as, you love them well as a Christian. I mean, the guy who I uh, uh, bought my house from uh, years ago, um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know what he expected from me. 
I mean, the guy who I bought it, uh, I can't remember his name exactly right now. I'm blanking out right now. Or everybody would probably, or there may be some people that maybe are over at the university that might know him, but um, he was surprised when I actually wanted to talk to him. I mean, he was a professor at the college, and listen, he served a, a Hindu god. I mean, so he, when I smiled at him, shook his hand, and he looked at me and says, you're not what I expected from a Christian, especially a pastor. Anybody ever had that happen to you? I, I say this because one pastor writes about an encounter uh, with a guy who was born overseas who had been tailoring suits, and, and, and he was in that town for decades making some of the most unbelievable suits. And when the pastor and the, the, the wife arrived for their appointment, um, the tailor greeted them and at the entrance of the, the door, and they walked back to this very nice place inside. And as they were entering, they noticed several tribal gods staring back at them. As they entered, the man said, welcome, pastor. Welcome, Mrs. Pastor. He didn't know what to call her. And so I'm so happy to serve you today, and I'm going to make a, a beautiful suit for you so that you will look your best. And then the pastor laughed, and he said this. He says, it's going to take a whole lot more than a new, look, a new suit to make me look good. And the tailor chuckled, and, and, and then they begin measuring and, and, and scribbling in this. And the man started scribbling in this little notebook. And before they were finished, it was time to go. And the pastor and wife thanked the man sincerely, telling him it was a great experience. And the man said, you are welcome, pastor. You are a delight. And then he says this, but you're not at all what I expected. Then curiously, the pastor says, well, why do you say that? Why is that? And, and he calls him by name. And what do you expect us to be like? The man had hesitated. And then he said the following. He said this, I've made suits for many other pastors and people who tell me they're Christians. They see my people's gods on the wall, and they, they say they are not real. One man in particular, a nationally prominent leader known for evangelism, this, evangelism, this pastor said, asked me to have a meal with him so he could tell me about Jesus. So I dined with him. I hung out with him, and he told me about Jesus. But when I could not give him the answer he wanted in the 30 minutes we had to eat together, he told me I would be sent to hell and then just left. You, on the other hand, you seem most kind. You, you treat me with respect and you make me laugh. I thank you. You're, you're much different than what I was expecting. The pastor then replies, says, I'm so sorry. You've had bad experiences with Christians. That's not the heart of Jesus. Maybe you could come and be my guest and meet some of the people I worship with at my church. Would you be willing to be my guest? How many of you think that sounds like a setup? Be your guest, he said. Come to your church, be your, be your guest. The man replied, I'd love to. And the man and his cousin went to his church. They both got saved because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. So listen, this is the takeaway. The, the nationally prominent guy that told the man he was going to hell, if I told you who he was, he's respectable. He believes probably pretty very, very similar to what we believe. But the guy has a cutthroat technique in sharing his Jesus. I don't question the nationally prominent evangelist beliefs. Listen, I mean, listen, you, you could read authors right and left and there could be minor disagreements. Uh, the main thing is Jesus, obviously, amen. So I, I question this guy's technique. In his approach to the suit tailor, listen, you can be correct, but you can also be not helpful. In fact, the suit tailor walked away from their conversation, feeling the door had been slammed in his face. And this is, and this is where the problem comes in. And this is why the message that we're, uh, the series of messages we're looking at in the, the book of Daniel, often Christians can mean well, but listen, they, don't, they might not love as well like Jesus loves. And every single encounter Jesus had with people, I mean, we see this unwavering attitude of love, even when they were called to leave their sin behind and follow him. I mean, think of the woman caught in adultery. I'm serious. I know we use this illustration, or this illustration gets used a lot, but I want you to think, really think about this. This poor woman was dragged out in front of everybody from her lover's bed into the streets. 
You want to talk about not cool, Robert Frost. This is that moment. I'm just saying, talk about being caught in your sin, right? How many of you would just really enjoy this opportunity? And here's the thing. Before you sit there and go, <laughs> listen, would you want to be caught in your sin? I say this, you know, it, it, was, it was more about trying to trap Jesus. They really weren't all that interested in catching her because they loved the truth so much. I mean, it wasn't that. It was more about trying to trap Jesus. According to the law, a woman's punishment was death by stoning. And the, the Pharisees, they, they wanted to trap Jesus between the old law, and, and, which it was the traditional path to righteousness before God, and new grace that Jesus had been talking about uh, and been preaching in the streets. And so look how Jesus responds to them because it's, it's left them, it actually leaves them speechless. Um, John chapter 8 says this, and, and as they continue to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Notice what seems like the fact that he almost takes her side, almost. And once more, he bent down and he wrote on the ground, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And this is where Jesus could have had, he could have taken the opportunity to be hyper grace and, you know, well, just hey, great to see you, good to see you in the streets, sorry that happened to you, you know. But since he's already defended her to some degree and shown her kindness, now he can actually give her the truth because I believe he has her attention now, don't you? Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, well, neither do I condemn you. Go on from now on, sin no more. I, I, just, I just love Jesus' response here. I mean, he, he doesn't condemn the woman like the religious legalist. I mean, instead, what does he do? Well, he shows her grace. I mean, but not so much grace that he lets her off the hook with her sin because he tells her to go and sin no more. Jesus, notice Jesus, he uh, avoids the, the extremes of either or by displaying both love and also righteousness. And listen, this is a model of how to interact with the diverse people around us that we are going to encounter more and more. Listen, whether it, it's like the guy that Taylor's suits or one of your colleagues who works in your building who maybe is a liberal activist. I mean, how do you stand firm and love well like Jesus? I mean, here's what you need to remember with all of this and how we can be thinking. And I just want you to see this because I, th I thought this was unbelievably true. It says this, truth without grace can be mean. Grace without truth, though, is meaningless. But let me just tell you something about truth and grace. They're good medicine. That you and I, we, we, that as people of God, that we would understand the responsibility we have to balance the truth of the standard of God's word with the reality of his loving acceptance and life-changing grace. I mean, and listen, living balanced, I'm just going to tell you, it's not easy. It's not an easy walk to walk a tightrope. I mean, it, was almost, it will almost always stretch you beyond your comfort zone. Uh, when culture, listen, when culture shifts, and by the way, can I just tell you, culture is always going to be shifting. There's always going to be something taking place in culture. But when it does, most people in the church world will tend toward, that there'll be a, a battle in your soul to go toward one direction or the other with this pendulum. I mean, we tend toward extremes when culture shifts. And many times the reason is, is it seems easier and it requires less of us if we just have like straight answers that then to walk the tightrope of truth and love. So listen, a Christian is tempted to go in one of these two directions. Uh, we either are looking at the culture that is going downhill so much so that we become angry, we become threatened, we become frustrated. So maybe we withdraw from culture attacking and con condemning people who don't agree with us exactly the way we want them to, or listen, we go the other way, where we become so battle-weary that we're tempted to issue some blanket statement 
acceptance statement that avoids any cultural conflicts at all, and we want to like wax politically correct. Listen, let, let me just set you free this morning. The good news of the gospel, and, and we've been studying it for a year in Romans, and, and, and if you haven't been with us, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. Listen, the good news of the gospel is so that you and I don't have to become paralyzed by the extremes of the, the, the crazy or people that want to beat people down with the scriptures. You and I can be the calm in the midst of the cultural storm. You and I can be that. And so, listen, that's the reason we're studying Daniel. That's the reason we're looking at this the next few weeks, because Daniel did that. And, but the only thing is, is if, if you think it's bad in the world we live in today, Daniel's dilemma was way worse than our current dilemma. I mean, so just to set the background up for you uh, as it pertains to Daniel and his day, um, after... Uh, if you look at Daniel's day, after the, the reign of King David and his son Solomon, Israel splintered. I mean, they went along geographical tribal lines uh, with a, within a few generations. The, the ten northern tribes uh, abandoned their faith in the living God, and they started worshiping idols. In fact, you, if you go back and look today, you can see this online, ge- geological finds in the northern biblical city of Dan um, suggests alongside the Yahweh temples, alongside the, the temple of God, there would a lot of times be buried these golden calves and these uh, goat demon looking, uh, idol looking things. And so obviously God was very displeased with this. He's not happy and he sends these warnings. He sends warning after warning after warning to stop worshiping these gods alongside of Yahweh. And, he, and he's doing this, he's talking to the northern kingdom only to have those warnings ignored. Does that sound like anybody else you know? Cricket. I mean, think about this. I mean, how many prophets of God have to come and tell you, you might get serious about the Lord, our nation's going down? Well, I don't want to talk about that, Pastor. I don't want to to talk about that because I really like my life. I really like the way things are. Listen, it's not about that. The question is, is are you going to serve God or are you going to not serve God? I mean, you look at this. Finally, we see their disobedience. It, it gets to the point where they leave God no choice. We're not going to repent of our idols. We like to worship God and we like to worship idols. We like to do that because that's what we like to do and we think that's how it should go. And so God says no more. And he allowed the Assyrian army to conquer all 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, 2 Kings chapter 17. Now, in order to explain this to you, I want you to see something. John Jenick, I need your help. I know you don't like this, but this is what happens when you show up to church. This is what happens. And so Steve's ducking down in his head. So right now, um, I'm going to do this right now. I'm scanning the crowd right now, just right now. I see some lucky sucker. Everybody's looking away from me right now. It's all right. Uh, Wyatt, would you come up here, buddy? I love you. Thank you. Everybody give Wyatt a hand. Can you come up here? I want you to stand right, stand right there and look that way. And I want you to stand right here, okay? Stand right there in front of that speaker. Okay, I need one more person. Steve, you thought you were going to get out of it. You're not. So, okay. Um, he didn't get the memo. You didn't get the memo? Well, if you didn't get the memo, you should be worried right now. Go ahead and stand right here, Steve. Look that way. Okay. Yeah, you're looking this way because here's the deal. Just say, I'm the Assyrian army, real loud to them. I'm the Assyrian army. Yes. You're the northern tribe, and you're the southern tribe, okay? The northern tribe has 10, and I'm not going to quote them all to you because I don't even think I could remember them right now. But anyway, the 10 tribes of Israel that were in the northern kingdom that God said over and over again, if you don't start repenting, Wyatt, you may feel like I'm preaching to you. I'm not. I'm not preaching at you. (laughs) If you don't repent, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send him, and he's going to beat you down. Now, remember, you're watching. Okay? All you got to do, go ahead, fake beat him down and fall to the ground. Fall to the ground. hurt. Okay? Now, at this point, come over here. You're next. (laughs) You're next, right? 
what do you think you might want to do if you know anything about the Lord right now? Because you've just seen your brother, right, go down. What do you think your response would be? <laughs> right? Right? Is, does anybody else get this, what I'm talking about? Would anybody else look and say, you know what, maybe it might be, you guys can go ahead and get down, thank them, can we, can we appreciate them? Thank you. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, we ought to think about possibly repenting before the Lord, should we not? And so, listen, the northern tribe, they got carried off in chains. Listen, just so you understand, Judah, Steve, Judah, the southern kingdom is where Daniel lived. And despite watching what happens to the northern kingdom with John Genic Assyria, the remaining people of Israel also drifted away from God. The tendency when we see somebody else do it is this little thing called normalcy bias. Uh, that's on TV. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. Coming to a town near you. I'm just saying this. If you want to see what happens to a nation that goes without repentance, this is how it's done. And when other kingdoms around it look and go, oh, that's not me. That's the same thing we can do when we come to a sermon like this. Oh, he's preaching to somebody else. I'm sure he's preaching to the person next to me because he couldn't possibly be preaching to me. So I, I'm just saying, judgment arrived in the form of, for Steve, it arrived in the form of another emperor, not John Jenig. It was the Babylonians. And it was the emperor Nebuchadnezzar how many of you ever heard of the name Nebuchadnezzar? And having already conquered Assyria and Egypt, they descended on Judah and they decimated the city of Jerusalem. I mean, imagine if your town, it was no longer standing. I mean, they, they not only looted the temple, but they, listen, they enslaved the Jewish people. And Judah, what happens with Judah? They crumbled. They were like, we're done. We don't know what else to do. The people of Israel become prisoners of war in this alien culture. They're exiled from their homeland. What that means is they were taken by chain to another place. And listen, Daniel is one of those exiles. And so scholars say that when that happened, he was around 16 years old when that happened. And that's as bleak as it gets for a teenager. What would you say if you were 16 years old and that happened to you? I mean, there were no leaders to organize a secret revolt. There were no legal recourse or government appeal. I mean, this was not something that you could go and say, well, that's just not fair. I'm an American. That's not how it worked. I mean, so listen, logically speaking, Daniel, he has no hope. And yet, as follows the pattern for people who truly do fear the Lord, Daniel, who served God, he never despaired and he never gave up. I mean, so here, here's what... Here's what we're going to see in this series. When you look at Daniel's life, you're going to see with humble confidence, Daniel glorifies God through his actions and through his speech. As well, listen, his character and his conduct, they stand out as well. Because Daniel is not only resolute, but he's also respectful. Doesn't, doesn't want to, doesn't, doesn't chime with some of the things that I know that I want to do. Somebody comes and takes my family off. Guess what? I think I got something for that. So listen, he didn't conform to the demands of Nebuchadnezzar, all the pagan customs he said they were, they were supposed to get or supposed to be a part of, nor did he act self-righteous, nor did he act judgmental, nor did he act defensive, if you will. Because listen, can, can I just tell you something? It's not always the case that your goal is to be right. 
And I, and I think sometimes what happens in the Christian world, we're so focused on being right that we don't really see the heart of the matter. We don't see people where they are. Listen, it's not about you being right. Listen, can we, can we say that God is truth and, and, and yes, the word of God is true, it's powerful, but listen, to a person that doesn't understand that and know that, I mean, it, they, they're not starting at the same starting block as you. So being right and being righteous at times aren't the same. And so for the next 70 years of Daniel's life, we're going to see Daniel, he's going to face life-threatening tests. And in response to Daniel's balance of steadfast, steadfast faith and commitment to both truth and grace, God demonstrates his supernatural power and he honors the one who actually honors him by blessing Daniel with the respect of four different Babylonian emperors. Last one of which was Cyrus, who granted the people Jewish freedom and they, they could return home. So today, I, I, let me ask you this question. Do you want to be influential in people coming to Jesus? I mean, I'm asking you this because seek to do what we see Daniel doing, truth and love. I mean, now, the first thing we're going to look at today, and I, I want you to see this because it's so important because it really hits us right between the eyes where we are in our culture today, and that's this. That's the whole setup. By the way, that, what I just gave you, that's the setup for this series. Now, the pieces that I want you to see today, what I want us to talk about for just a moment is this, confused identities. Any culture's most powerful tool to integrate people into a different system is to confuse identities. Anybody think that kind of remotely sounds familiar? I mean, th th there is an attempt in our culture, and listen, do I think that every, every single person that would be behind this actually even knows what they're doing? I'm not saying that. I'm saying there are some that do. But I do believe that when you look at this, there is an attempt in our culture, and it has demonic influence behind it, whether people even, how many of you know that you can be used by the enemy, whether, and sometimes even as a Christian, sometimes the enemy can use you. So I'm just saying, there is an attempt in our culture, and it has demonic influence behind it to do one thing and one thing alone, and that's this, to rename you and to rename your kids to rename your children, to rename your families, to rename your grandchildren, to call you something other than what you really are as a believer in Jesus Christ. W.C. Fields, he said this. How many of you remember this guy? Anybody remember that guy from TV from old, long time ago? Some of you are, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving away how old I am because I've seen this in black and white actually at times, but um, the American comedian, um, he was also an actor, he was a juggler, uh, a writer from the early 1900s, he put it this way. He said this, It ain't what they call you. <laughs> it's what you answer to. How many of you remember W.C. Fields? Raise your hand high. Okay. I'm just asking that because he, he's a, it, it's not biblical truth. I'm just pointing out to you. In Daniel's case, this happens to be kind of important. So listen, in fact, there's a there's a lot in a name, and I, I mean, uh, some of you that know the story behind me and Terry was us, us having children uh, when we had Jaden. Jaden's name means God has heard. It's in the Bible. And the reason God heard, God has heard, was because we weren't able to have kids. We were struggling. We were losing babies. And Jaden was our first child after having experienced loss several times. And, and then along came Aiden, who's not here this morning. His name means laughter, and it's very true how that plays out. But certainly, these names play out. I mean, so now we live in a world that is adept at doing what is right in everybody's eyes. Like, like we're talking about the, the book of Judges, and we studied that several years ago, you know, so where people are defining their own identities, you know, according to their own culturally shifting ideas from school-aged children who want to change their genders uh, to couples of the same uh, uh, gender planning, planning their weddings. And it's, listen, it's increasingly acceptable to do what feels right. 
You do you has kind of become the mantra in some circles, the idea of living out your own truth. Reality TV portrays anybody can be a star. So that's why you end up singing, what was that guy? Well, I don't even want to talk about that. Never mind. That was a bad idea because I'm just thinking of the song and I'm thinking about the words and that's not good. Anyway, so (laughs) some of you played that movie through with me just now too. So anyway, if you remember the American Idol There was some guy that was on there, and I can't remember his name. But anyway, so don't worry about that. We'll just erase that off the tape. So um, reality TV portrays this idea that, you know what? Hey, you can do it. You can be a star. You know, I mean, entitlement. It demands reinvention of self. Hey, I get to be who I want to be as long as you remain true to yourself. And I can sort of understand why this is appealing because you can... You can do whatever you want. I mean, you can be, wait a minute, you can, you can be your own God. I mean, so today I'm identifying as a very rich person who doesn't have, have to work ever again. That's what I'm identifying as, right? So, I mean, listen, I'm not saying that as funny. I'm saying that because the truth is, is that that's the culture you and I live in. I mean, when the truth is God has has created me for his purposes, not my own purposes. The truth is, I mean, you and I don't have the privilege of defining ourselves. You may say, well, why not? I mean, I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, the reason is simple. We've already been defined by God. Can I tell you this? He's your creator. He's your maker. God knows who he has made each of us to be. And in the end, listen, I can tell you, his design is always better. I mean, and many times what we come up with on our own, I mean, so Daniel understands this. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Then the king commanded Ashman as his chief eunuch to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skilled skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and and language of the Chaldeans. How many of you have read this before? Raise your hand real high. Okay, you look at this. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Everybody say names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Ananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. What you, what you have to understand in those days, because here's the deal. We've, we've heard the veggie tale version of this. Shadrach and Benny. How many of you remember that? So what you have to understand in those days when victors came in and destroyed and integrated enslaving their own cap, uh, captives into their culture it was customary to change the captives' names as a sign of ownership. So the Israelites belong to their captors now. I mean, Daniel is one of those. And so no longer would they actually be known by their old names from their homeland. So, but, but listen, these Babylonian names weren't just different. A lot of times we think some things are just different. And listen, sometimes things are just different and it's cultural and it's, but listen, these names weren't meant to just be cultural. These names were meant to obliterate the Israelite identity. And you may say, well, how so? Just looks like names to me. I mean, they just went from having weirder names, weird names to weirder names, right? So weird name one, weird name two, you know what I mean? Well, first... What I want you to know is these names are a mockery to their heritage. That's one. Number two, they basically actually turned their names inside out. And then in fact, they were not just inside out names, but they're actually idolatrous names. So if you look at the original names and the Babylonian renames of these four Hebrew young men, it becomes very clear the strategy in Babylon. It becomes very clear what's actually going on. It's, it's really the same thing that's happening in our culture today. We just don't see it like that. I mean, the enemy is, listen, 
Is it true that the enemy is lying to people? Is it true that the enemy is longing to cause people not to see their true identity? Causing them to think something different about their own self than what God wants them to think about their own identity? In fact, I want you to take a closer look at Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's name. I want you to see it up here. The first one is Daniel. It means God is my judge. Now look at what the Babylonians changed it to. Belteshazzar means lady, protect the king. So the first thing that happens, I want you to see this because the first thing that happens is change of gender of Daniel's name, which would be a very inherent part of, a, of each person's identity. Notice also, they also shift the focus from God to human. And so with this new name, Daniel's identity, at least on paper, changes from a man held accountable by an all-powerful God to that of a woman who must protect her God, small g, because she's strong. In their culture, this would have been an unbelievably horrible insult. So the meaning of Daniel's new name was the antithesis of this former Hebrew name. So... Let's look at Hananiah for a second. It means God has been gracious. And look at what they rename it to. Shadrach. We think Shadrach and Benny, and that's really great, right? You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We think, ah, oh, yeah, that's their names. Well, actually, it wasn't their names. When you get to heaven, you might not want to call them that. You might want to call them by their other names. I'm just kidding. So, Shadrach... Instead of it being God has been gracious, Shadrach means I'm fearful of God. Notice the Babylonians inverted the focus from God being good to God being bad now. Sound familiar? I mean, instead of viewing him as gracious, kind, loving, everything that implied in Hananiah's name, their, their new name echoed with the kind of fear you'd feel for somebody that would be like a maniac or a tyrant or a monster That's how you should feel standing in his presence. That's going to be your name. And then there's Mishael, which means who can compare to my God? No one can. That's a cool name, isn't it? Mishael, who can compare to my God? Nobody. And look what they change it to, Meshach. It means I'm despised, contemptible, and humiliated. And again, they're choosing a name that subverts the goodness of God in their relationships to him, shifting the focus from a confidence in God to actually a cowardice. So let's look at Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. And look what they do with it. Abednego means the servant of Nebo. Notice Azariah goes from being a servant and an heir of Yahweh, which would be a term of endearment for, a, for the person that would be in his shoes for the living God, to being the slave of another man. All you, listen, all you have to do is consider the way society continues to redefine all the things that we see happening right now, whether it be gender, relationships, marriage, whatever it might be. And listen, it's happening in our culture too. I mean, things that were once inherent in who we were or who we are have now become flexible and have now become up up for debate. And if, if God's the one that named us, let me ask you a question. Do you think God is confused? Another way the enemy tries to change our identities is by making it seem foolish to remain faithful to God. It's almost better to pretend like you struggle. Oh, I, I just have a struggle with relationship. Listen, w- listen. do you want to struggle in a relationship? Or do you want to go and ex- exceed the heights with God? How many of you want to do that? I, I don't want to just sit there and struggle all the time. Listen, is there a struggle? Yes, there's a struggle. But listen, some of you need to get past your past. You need to go forward. Because Jesus Christ will allow you to do that. In fact, he'll actually propel you to do that. You open the Bible, and I promise you, you begin to do that every single day, and I promise you things will change in you. The reason is, is because he's alive. He's, he's, he's life. 
He's, he's, he's hope, right? So, in Daniel's day, this whole thing of making it seem foolish to remain faithful in God, it was kind of done in a, in a conquest, assimilated way that we're seeing here, kind of more like a tribal approach, if you will. These days, listen, there's lots of methods that that happens with, whether it be comedy and satire. I mean, we, we see comedy and satire happening everywhere, all over the place, with anything to do with God, all the way to controversy, scandal within the church world. We see churches folding, like through COVID. How many of you have seen lots of churches fold in COVID? I'm saying I have seen it personally. So if the devil can discredit the Bible and disgrace the church through division, dissension, immorality, then listen, he's succeeded. As a result, most Christians are so intimidated by the world, so we become convinced that somehow church and God should be private and relegated to one day a week, and the world can be as bold as they want to be, but a Christian has to kind of sit there and be quiet because they should be embarrassed by their narrow viewpoint. Listen, there's nothing to be embarrassed about with Jesus when you're talking about God's viewpoint because, listen, he is the creator of the universe and the world. So, and certainly people are tempted to, listen, I, I get it. I like, how many of you like appro- being approved by other people around you? You like your, you love to have somebody tell you, hey, that was really great. You did a good job there. Or, or maybe, man, I really love you. And they've come and put their arm out. How many of you like that? You enjoy that? You how many of you don't like that? That'd be another sermon I'll make out of sometime soon. But anyway, I'm just saying, you know, there, there's, there's something about a, an approval that we all need to some degree. We, we desire approval, do we not? And it's easy to get caught up, and I know it's not just Facebook anymore, but the, the idea of Facebook likes, positive comments, um, retweets, we love stuff like that. And many times this, this feels like approval, clear proof that you and I have value that clear proof that our choices have value, look at me, that they are right, that, that, man, I'm on the right track. I mean, it can be intoxicating. 24-hour access to continual validation. Yes, somebody liked my lifestyle choice. All of us struggle to some degree or other with the desires to please other people, but as a believer, we have to get past who it is that we're trying to please. I mean, I, I could have 10 people say they love last week. So how many of you, I just say this. How many of you have ever had somebody compliment you and then someone come along and it was just one little comment and it like it kind of makes you upset? It, you can have 10 people over here say, man, that was great. And then one person over here going, you're stupid. And then you're like, you know what I mean? You want to just like go and crawl in a hole and die. Anybody ever done that before? Okay, I'm just saying. It didn't happen to me last week, but... Happened to the week before. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I mean, just say it. I could have ten people, you know, say they love last week's service, but one person come up to me and complain. And listen, it could be, it could it has a p- potential to ruin your perspective, does it not? And so instead of giving God glory, hey man, God, you did really some cool things in about ten people's life. That's really great. You saved three people. People got healed this week at Radical Life. I'm. Can I tell you that? People got healed at Radical Life. Isn't that cool? So, just saying. So, I mean, I I, I get hung up wondering, what could I do to try to please the one person? Instead of actually celebrating what God has done in so many other ways. And the truth is, is we have to remind ourselves, the truth is, it's, it's not about what I'm doing. Can I tell you that? It's not about what you're doing. Let me, let me say what is important. It's about what he's doing and how you're a part of that. So I, I have to say, I mean, if God is doing something through you, God is working in your life and, and through you, through his, through his church, through you being a part of that, listen, I can tell you, that is one of the most powerful things you'll ever do. You being used by God in his, not, I, hey, listen, I think we, we get mixed up. In his church, the church is not a, a building. The church is God's people. And so the takeaway on this, and Sarah, you guys can make your way back. Musicians come back and play softly, but the 
takeaway from that is this, and I want you to see this, and you can write this down because I don't think it's in your notes, but here it is. Let's just look at it for a second. Think about it. Your identity will shift when you value people around you looking at you more than you value people looking at what God is doing. Listen, it's the same in your life as it is in the captives' lives in ancient Babylon. It's the same in your life today as it was back then for Daniel. I mean, when culture shifts, listen, do you know who you are? Do you know what your identity is in? If your identity is in you being you and you doing you, I can promise you that's going to shift because culture will shift and you doing you won't be popular at some point in your life. So then you'll have to shift. But listen, those who are founded deep down in the roots of Jesus Christ and you're planted like a tree by the water. Your roots go down deep. When the rain comes, oh yes, that water gets up close to that tree. But listen, let me tell you something. When that water goes down, that, that tree when the water goes down to bear and there's nothing and you could actually cross over on dry ground, that tree still has its roots so deep that it doesn't need the water next to it. All it has to do is keep going down and get to water. And listen, that tree will still have green leaves. All I'm trying to tell you today is this. Who is your hope in? Just like Jeremiah you look at this, and I see this, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. I want you to see this verse before we go. In their day, it says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, Jeremiah, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I want you to think about this. Steve... I've appointed you to win people with the gospel before you were born. John Jinnick, he's like, his eyes are big because he's like, he's going to use me next. I know he is. Listen, before you were born, God destined that you would actually do what you're doing for him. I'm just saying, like, you look at it. You look at everything. Every single person in here, just take your finger out and point to the person next to you. Can you do that real quick? Just point. Just point at them. Say, you know what? God has picked you. God has picked you. Listen, not the sinful version of you, but the version of you that's in Christ Jesus. That's who he has determined. Romans 8, 17, put it like this when we studied it, co-heirs with Jesus. We're adopted into the family of the king. How many of you, that excites you? You're a part of the kingdom of God. You are an heir in the family. You're not just somebody who actually is a distant cousin and gets to show up at the, at the, at the, at the palace every once in a while. No, 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 no. You have refrigerator rights in the palace. Can I just tell you that? And unless you're grounded in who you are, The way we see ourselves will morph and become like cultural images that we see out there. Well, I've got to to recreate myself to be that. Listen, no, you don't. The rapids of culture will always try to sweep us downstream away from who God created us to be. And the enemy of our souls, he's going to always try to look for opportunities to undermine our true identities. God's divinely designed children. He's always longed for you to be found in him. That's all the more reason to dwell on the certainty of who God says we are and to be motivated by loving out the purpose for which he has made us to be. So the takeaway as believers this morning is this. Am I following God's truth about me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Am I following God's truth about me? As the team plays softly this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you following God's truth about you? 
I mean, if you place identity in physical appearance, if you place it in performance, if you place it in possessions or anything else, listen, you aren't alone. We have all found ourselves grasping at things other than God to fill the deep places in our hearts that were only meant for Him. But if we don't recognize this, it's going to be hard to continue to work towards staying connected to the God who made us, knows us, and loves us. To, listen, to become anchored by the knowledge of who God has made us to be, we must see ourselves the way He sees us. You may say, well, how do I do that? Perhaps the first step in this process is recognizing the biblical truth that every single person is born under God's timing and in the season that they're born into. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says from this, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God chose you and he has always loved you. He determined when you would be born and when you will die because he chose us before the creation of the world. So listen, you and I can take comfort in knowing that our Father specifically chose this place in all of time and history for our lives to exist and that our lives exist, they should exist for his purposes. Specifically gifted to help propel kingdom purposes in a calling specifically designated and designed for you to bring God glory. Listen, you are here on purpose and you are here for a purpose. Because God Almighty saw to it. And once you understand that purpose, the Bible tells us our lives are meant to glorify God. Not to be famous, not to do what we want. Our lives were designed to glorify Him. And once a person understands that, then suddenly they become a spiritual force for the kingdom. If we don't see things like God sees them, listen, then people and culture and the world will apply their labels onto you and some may even seem somewhat accurate, but listen, you will begin to con confuse and conform to those ideologies. But when your life, when you live out your God-given identity, listen, can I tell you something? False labels won't stick. Your awareness of being the person God created you to be it permeates, it will permeate everything you do, every decision you make, every place you go, everything you set your hands to do. No demon in hell will be able to convince you otherwise. You're a child of the living God and your identity is in and through him in Jesus' name. Those of you who are here this morning, heads bowed and eyes closed, and you want your identity in him to be solidified, that you want more than ever before this morning for your identity to be found in him, I just want you right now to slip your hand up before heaven. Maybe you're already a child of God, but you would slip your hand up to heaven and say, you know what, I want my identity to be found in him more than it's ever been in my entire life. That's you today. Yes. Hands going up everywhere. Let me pray over you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these hands that have lifted. I thank you for these individuals that are saying, God, I want my, I want my identity and my purpose to be found in you. It starts, oh God, with knowing you. So God, we're asking you to help us know you. The power of your resurrection. I pray that every single person in this room, Lord, that you would give them a desire. That desire has to come from you. Give them a desire and a hunger for your word and to know you more. The person of Jesus Christ, Lord, that they would long to know you and the power of your resurrection. That they would be so willing to know you, Jesus, that they would be willing to suffer if necessary. I thank you for these hands raised. Let these people be found in you more than ever before. Let them have that closeness, that connectedness with you that only can be found inside of a time alone with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are still closed, others of you who are here, maybe you love truth and you've determined in your heart that you as a person of the word are going to stand firm, which is great. But somewhere in the standing firm 
that you're doing at times you find yourself mixing in hate for people and with your in with your hate for evil. Sometimes it can be confusing. And yes, certainly there can be evil pe- people. I mean, the Bible talks about wise people, foolish people, and evil people and that we encounter, but even God in all of his power doesn't di- desire to send evil people to hell. He longs for all people to repent. And that should be our attitude. That should be my yeah, that should be your attitude. It should be my attitude and our desire. So we should long for people to go to heaven. You'd say, Pastor, just real honestly, what I need is I need God to soften my heart because I see the world around me crumbling and it breaks my heart for people not to know the truth and for people not to see the truth. And and I don't want to react. What I want to do is I want to respond, oh God. I want to respond with, Lord, my heart being broken for people. If that's you today, you'd say, I want my, I want my life to be a life of love for people. Yes, I want to balance the truth, and I want to balance that truth with love, though. You're here today, and you'd say, that's me. That message is for me today. Yes, 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 yes. Hands going up everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for these hands that are up today, God. We pray, God, that you would help us to be balanced as your people, oh God. Those two things aren't really that different. (laughs) Especially when you did it, Lord, you showed us the balancing act. Lord, you showed us how to walk that tightrope, oh God. You, You were a God of truth. You still are a God of truth. You're a when you walk this earth, you, you showed people the truth. You showed people the way. You, sh- you showed people the light. But you also loved people like nobody else. God, help us. Help these that their hands are raised today. God, help each and every one of us to, Lord, be people of truth and love. May we love people like you love people, Jesus. Give us a love for people. Every single person here, God, Lord, I pray that you would just give them a heart and a desire for people to come to know you. And Lord, even if they don't, God, for us to continue to love them like you love them, oh God. Help us to do that. We thank you, Jesus. Still others with head bows and eyes closed this morning, maybe you're here and you don't know God. Maybe you're watching online and you don't know the Lord. You haven't submitted your life to the Lord. What you need to understand about that process is this. There's no amount of good that you can do to save you. Only Jesus can save a person. And being good is nice in the moral sense, but you can't be moral enough to earn your way to heaven. No amount of being religious can cause you to deserve heaven. This morning you realize that and you also recognize that your sin separates you from a holy God. And today you find yourself being drawn to the Lord and you sense a godly sorrow in your heart over your sin and you don't want to continue sinning. You have a sincere desire to repent. That is the Holy Spirit working in your life, drawing you to God. He wants to work in your life and change you from the inside out. But it first takes repentance turning from your sin. That's the only way to remove God's wrath upon people's lives who are without God. Is to repent, to to submit to God's plan by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. To deny your own desires and take up God's plan. The plan of the cross, repenting of all your sin and submitting your life completely over to Him. You recognize that through faith in Jesus Christ, God can make you in right standing with him through Jesus Christ. That's your only hope today. Outside of that, there's no hope. But you recognize that hope in him today. That's you today. I want you right now, heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you right now, right where you're at. You'd slip your hand up to God this morning. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We have one today. Yes. See your hand. Thank you so much for being honest with before the Lord. Is there anyone else?
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to do something. I want us to stand right where we are. We have one person that's saying, man, they want to make things right with Jesus Christ. And that's exciting to me. This morning, never want to take that for granted. Maybe you're here and you didn't run, raise your hand. If you're like me, I'm going to be honest with you, if I showed up to this church, I'm not talking about just this church, but anywhere, I want to know what I'm getting myself into before I actually raise my hand. Just being honest. Maybe you're here and you're like, man, I raised my hand and are they going to like, are they going to put me up in the baptistry right now? You know, are they going to, what are they going to do? Are they going to, am I going to have to do a flip? You know, or what am I going to have to do? You know what I mean? Listen, I'm going to tell you something today. You didn't raise your hand, but you know things aren't right between you and the Lord. I encourage you to pray this prayer and then to tell the team in the back that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I encourage you to go back to that table and find that table and say, you know what? I'm committing my life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't have time to do that. Maybe you're late for something. I don't know. Maybe there's a a roast in the oven or whatever. I don't know. But you grab the app and let us know. I need Jesus Christ. I'm I'm committing my life to Jesus Christ through the Life Church app. I I would encourage you to do that. I'm just telling you something. God is changing people's lives here, not just this Sunday, but he's doing it Sunday after Sunday, and we blow it off like it's no big deal. Can I tell you something? Who else can change a heart? No one. He's that great. He can do that, and he can take the foolishness of a sermon like this and change somebody's life. That blows my mind. So all I'm saying today is this. Don't take for granted what you got. I'm not talking about this church and these people and this. I'm not talking about me even. I'm, I'm just saying, don't take for granted what God has so graciously given you in his presence. He longs to change us. He longs to do things in us. Amen? And he's beginning with one person this morning. And maybe there are others that didn't raise their hand. Jesus Christ can change your life. And I would encourage you to pray this prayer and mean it with all of your heart. Let God change you from the inside out. Let him do a miracle in your life. Because let me tell you something, he can do a miracle. There's person after person in this church can talk about that miracle. Let's pray this together this morning. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinful person. And I also know that my only fix is you. So today I repent of all my sin and I allow you to turn my life around. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Fill my deep need for you. Help me to discover the deep satisfaction that only you can bring. Thank you for saving me. Now help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, can we just clap and shout to God this morning? (laughs) Praise you, God. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your people. God, we ask that today as we leave this place, that, Lord, that you would help us to be people of truth and love. May we stand firm, but may we also love well like you've called us to. In Jesus' awesome name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.